Hey everybody, I thought about doing something a little different today. And as we talk about leadership, do you join me for a coffee as we talk a little bit more about Hezekiah and his leadership style? I think there's some amazing things that we can learn from this. And I'd like to invite you to come and sit down with me for Leadership Masterclass. So far, we've learned some awesome things about King Hezekiah and his leadership style and how he has established leaders and taught them how to consecrate themselves and to give to God and to worship together. And we're here in 2 Chronicles chapter 30, and it says it this way, and Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel. Now we already know that King Hezekiah started giving sacrifices on behalf of Israel, that he was praying for Israel as the king of Judah. Remember, Israel and Judah have been disconnected for a long time. They fought each other, they have been at each other's throats, although they're family and although they're connected, there has been this huge, uh, you know, issue and infighting and problems and Israel has not been following God. For the vast majority of this time in these stories, Israel was uh, doing false idol sacrifices, doing a lot of horrible things uh, and having false prophets, all that type of stuff. And Hezekiah is like, hey, I'm going to send an invitation to Israel. And this, this is so big. I mean, the king, verse two, it says the king had taken counsel and his princes and all the congregation in Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month, for they could not keep it at that time because the priests had not sanctified themselves sufficiently. Neither had the people gathered themselves together at Jerusalem. And the thing, there is verse four, the thing pleased the king and all the congregation. So they came together and they said, hey, one of our biggest celebrations and uh, a time that we really need to gather together as both Israel and Judah is to celebrate the Passover, to celebrate where the angel of death came up against us. And yet God uh, said that if you would sprinkle the blood over the doorposts, then the angel of death would be passed off. And he said, man, we need to remember that God gave us this opportunity, this blood, to really be able to save us from certain death. And really, it's a type and shadow of Jesus and saying how important it is for us to celebrate the blood of Christ that redeemed us from a possible negative scenario, negative past, like to, to redeem us from hell that we deserved and the punishment we deserved and gather together. And he's saying this to both, remember, Israel and Judah. Now, I bet you there are some people in Judah that might have family members that were killed by people in Israel, that may have had things stolen by people in Israel, right? And, and yet, it says that when the king said this and his heart was in inviting broken people to come and celebrate the redemptive power of the blood, it said that it pleased not just the king, but also all of the congregation. It meant that the king's heart was then transferred to all of the people. You know, when we talk about at Faith for Life, we love God, we love people, and we live our faith. Uh, you know. We also talk about every Sunday is a party. Why? Because it's us celebrating what Jesus has done, is doing, and will do in our lives, right? We talk about every Monday is a mission because we remember that we are here to invite people into life. We are we are on our workplaces and in our homes and have these opportunities to invite people into the faith life. Every Monday is a party. Every person is important and that's kind of what they're understanding here is that yeah they might have a checkered past they may have a lot of problems that they're dealing with but god's put me in this person's life for such a time as this for such a place as this and for such a people as this like I, i'm here for a reason and so it, it, the heart of invitation 
was not just for leaders, but for the entire congregation. And that's one of the things that we need to be believing for is for our church to have a heart of invitation, to be able to have opportunities to invite people to come to the congregation, to come to Sunday services. That's what he's saying. I want to invite everyone in Israel that may not even have their life right to come and to see, to come and hear what God is doing in our lives, what he has done and what he's continuing to do as we celebrate the redemptive power of the blood. And it says in verse five, so they established a decree to make a proclamation throughout all Israel from Beersheba even to Dan, that they should come and keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel at Jerusalem. For they had not done it of a long time in such sort as it was written. So the posts went with the letters from the king and the princes throughout all Israel and Judah, according to the commandment of the king saying, you children of Israel. So here's the princes, here's the leaders, here's all the important men in Judah. And the king said, hey, I'm giving you this invitation and I'm sending you across the paths of the hurting, the dying, the wounded and the afflicted. I'm sending you out to where their homes are, where their workplaces are. And he said, when you get there, I want you to send the invitation. I, I want you to tell them these things. And what do you say, you children of Israel, turn to the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and he will return the remnant of you and that are escaped out of the hand of the kings of Assyria. Don't be like your fathers and like your brethren, which trespassed against the Lord God of their fathers, who therefore gave them up to desolation, as you have seen. He said, man, look, you, your family hasn't had the best past. He's like, man, look, there's a lot of problems that are going on in your life. You know the issues, you know the desolation. I don't have to tell you your problems. And this is a great opportunity for invitation. Uh, I always tell people that, you know, the gospel is the good news of God. But you can't tell someone God's good news unless you've had an opportunity to hear their bad news. And so it's important for us to establish a connection and communication with the people that God has placed around our life to try to figure out what is your bad news so that I can tell you the good news of the gospel. Maybe their bad news is that they've been in constant bad relationships. Well, good news is that God wants to have a relationship with you and he is faithful. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He cares about your future. Maybe their bad news is that they have a financial issue in their life. Well, I know Jehovah Jireh, who's a great provider. I can tell you the testimony of God's goodness in my life and how he has provided for me and he can do the same thing for you. Maybe they're, they're their issue is that they're confused and they can't seem to make the right decisions. Well, I know the good news of the gospel is that when you accept Jesus, you can have the mind of Christ and the Holy Spirit can be your guide into all things. And uh, so it's important for us to find out what is their bad news so that I can share with them the good news of the gospel. And so it's important for us to establish communication, understand these things. Here we have Hezekiah who knew the issues and the problems that were surrounding the people of Israel. So he sends out an invitation, says, let me invite you to new life. Let me invite you to church. Let me invite you to come and experience with me the amazing power of the blood. Uh, let's celebrate Passover together. And remember, I know the desolation. I know the problems that are going on. And I know that God can turn those around. And, and he says in verse, uh, da, 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 verse eight, it says it this way. Now, don't be stiff necked. He says, now look, you're gonna make a million excuses. One of the things that, that God told me uh, several years ago as a leader, one, <clears throat> one of my primary responsibilities is to help people allevi alleviate excuses. It means that I, I want to stop, uh, I want to be a part of helping people to find what excuses are holding them back 
from doing what God has called them to do, from stepping forward into uh, serving, from uh, being regular in what God, in a part of the community of the church and all those type of things. My job as a leader and your job as a leader, because I'm talking to leaders tonight, is to find ways to alleviate excuses, help people to get away from the excuses that they are allowing to hinder them from uh, really walking out the gifts and callings and purposes of God in their life. The, the excuses that are actually holding them back from the blessings that God has already released. And that's what he said. He said, don't be stiff necked. He said, I know your excuses. I'm telling you right now, don't allow those excuses to hold you back from doing what you know God is telling you to do, right? He said, don't be stiff necked uh, like your fathers were, but yield yourself to the Lord. And how do you do that? How do you yield yourself to the Lord? He gives them two things. First, enter into his sanctuary. He said, you can't tell me that you yield yourself to God and you don't show up to church. He, he said, he, you need to yield yourself to the God to and to God by entering his sanctuary because here's a whole bunch of people in Israel who are saying like yeah I kind of serve God like yeah I kind of go back to the way the ancestors did things but they hadn't shown up uh in in the temple they hadn't shown up and Hezekiah's like hey this is your invitation to get things right it's your invitation to come back again and he says so Yield yourself to the Lord by entering his sanctuary, which he has sanctified forever. And two is serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. For if you turn again to the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that lead them captive, so that they will come again back to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return to him. So notice that here, the promises of God are eternal. And I love to, to, to think about and remind myself of his promises, but also the promises of God are conditional. Did you notice the word if? The if was talked about several times in these verses. He said, man, God wants to turn away your captivity. God wants to uh, bring you back to the land that he has promised you. God wants to fulfill these things in your life. He said, but in order to do that, he said, first, you need to come back to the sanctuary, come back to the congregation, come back to the family of faith, the community of faith. And he said, two, he, you need to uh, serve the Lord your God. He said, man, you need to get away from any of these excuses that hinder you from serving in some capacity in some way. He said, here's the condition is that you need to be a part of community and you need to be serving God and serving people in some way or some manner. He said, then God can actually cause grace to happen towards you. And uh, one of the definitions of grace is divine influence upon the human heart. And that's what he said. He said, man, God will actually cause compassion to rise up in your captors so that you now, so that they want to release you, want to give you opportunities. And you know, the, the truth is favor is greater than any of the money in all of the world. God says that if you do this, if you return to the Lord, if you return into the congregation, if you find a place to serve God and serve people, he said, then I will cause grace to abound towards you or the divine influence upon the human heart will be sent towards you so that even those that are your bosses or your co-workers or uh, you know the the people who seem to be against you or holding you back is that I'm going to cause compassion to go upon their heart and bring you back again so verse 10 so then the posts were passed from city to city throughout the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, even unto Zebulun. And, but they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. Nevertheless, diverse of Asher and Manasseh and of Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. Let me wait for that to pass. <laughs> diverse of Asher and Manasseh and of Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem to Jerusalem. Now, there's two responses to every invitation. And we'll see here that there are two responses to people who really are bringing an invitation for people to come back into the congregation, to, to invi an invitation for people to come to church, 
to come and experience the faith life with them. And the first one is that they laugh them to scorn. Not everyone that you give an invitation to is going to respond in a gracious way or in a, a connective manner. Some people are going to laugh in your face and say, there is no way I'm finding myself a church. There's no way I am going to a congregation or anything like that. Or maybe you'll hear those people who say like, look, I'm spiritual. I'm religious. Uh, I just, I'm not just, just really not into church, which is a big problem biblically because a uh, church is the body of Christ as we gather together. Don't tell me that you love Jesus, but you hate his body. Um, and it, it's so important for us to have this, but for, for us to be giving invitations, but we need to know that sometimes the response is going to be that people don't receive, they don't connect, they don't, they don't like that you invited them. Some people may even get upset that you bring an invitation to them. That's okay. You need to respond and understand that even the people that don't receive from you, you are sowing a seed into their life. You are actually giving them something and an opportunity for someone else to, uh, to water that seed or to allow that seed to grow in a greater way, right? Uh, and, but then there's the second, um, the, the second response to an invitation. And we see here in that response is that the, there were diverse of Asher and Manasseh and, and Zebulun that humbled themselves and came. That there are going to be some people that say, man, I, I do receive that. I'm going to show up. I'll be there. Right. And what's interesting about this, I wanted to say, I don't believe that these people in Asher, Manasseh and Zebulun, I don't believe that these people, this is the first time that somebody told them to get their life right before God. I don't think it's the first time that somebody gave them an invitation to connect. And I think that this is just the harvest of what somebody else sowed into their life. And so this invitation, then some of them came and gathered. It said also in Judah, the hand of God was to give them one heart to do the commandment of the king and the princes by the word of God. Now, I like this. The idea is that as they gathered together, they became unified and connected and they were able to serve the king and the princes by the word of God. Now, that's important because it was not just that they gathered together and uh, when God gave them unity, they just followed whatever the government said. That's not what it says. It says that they followed the word of the king and the commandment of king by the word of God. If the commandment of the king and the commandment of governmental leadership does not agree with what the word says, I am not required to follow. And you'll see that, man, throughout history, the importance of people who uh, believe in God, follow God, connect with what God is doing, and yet find themselves on the other side of uh the laws that are passed or anything like that. It's important that we only are following. Doesn't mean that we stop respecting and praying for leadership. That is a part of our responsibility as leaders, as a part of our responsibility as believers. But it is also important that we note, is this law, is this decision in connection with the word or is it in opposition with what God says? If it's in opposition, I'm not required to follow it. That's why it says here uh, that they were of one heart to do the commandment of the king and the princes by the word of God. Verse 13. And there they assembled at Jerusalem, much people, to keep the feast of unleavened bread. That's also Passover, same thing, in the second month of very great congregation. And they arose and took away the altars that were in Jerusalem and took all the altars for incense took away and they cast them into the brook of Kidron. And then, then they killed the Passover on the 14th day in the second month. And the priests and the Levites were ashamed and sanctified themselves and brought in the burnt offerings into the house of the Lord. So I want you to notice this. So a part of the celebration of Passover is also the celebration of unleavened bread. Now, we talked about the importance of Passover as celebrating um, what the blood has done 
in redeeming us from the curse of the law, the curse of sin and death. And, but also connected with that celebration was unleavened bread. And the whole idea of this is that Moses had commanded the people to uh, make sure that when they make bread, they make it with no leaven, which means that you don't have to wait uh, to be able to do something uh, to, you need to be, how do I say it? You need to be ready in a moment's notice to be able to follow and step forward in whatever God asks you to do. That's what unleavened bread is. It's saying that because of the blood of Christ, we are now living not according to the curse of the law, but now we have the, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that set us free from the law of sin and death. Because of his blood, we live an unleavened life. The unleavened life is also the ability to follow God immediately when he asks us to do anything. That we already have everything that we need to accomplish whatever God has asked us to do in any moment. It is not waiting and not delaying when the Holy Spirit puts on our heart to minister to someone, to pray to someone, to give to someone, to give to something, to, uh, to step forward in a certain way. The, we live these unleavened lives saying that, God, when you tell me to move, I'm moving. When you tell me to speak, I'm speaking. When you tell me to give, I'm giving. Uh, I'm not waiting and delaying and waiting for my flesh or my soul to get in connection to my spirit. I'm going to follow quickly and I'm going to follow right away. Because of the blood of Christ, I have been redeemed from the past. And uh, because of the word, because I spend time in the word, I'm able to separate my soul and my spirit and make the decision that when you speak something to my spirit, I act right away in that opportunity. That's unleavened living. And so it's important that the celebration of Passover is also connected to the celebration of unleavened bread. Uh, let's go on to verse 16. And they stood in their place after their manner, according to the law of Moses, the man of God. The priests sprinkled the blood which they received of the hands of the Levites, for there were many in the congregation that were not yet sanctified. Therefore, the Levites had charge of killing of the Passover for everyone that was not clean to sanctify them unto the Lord. Again, this is so important. When we have service, when we gather together on Sundays, when we celebrate and worship with one another, we need to understand that there's a lot of people who come to church and they have not really given their lives over to God. They don't know 100% uh, what it means to live a life of faith. They may not be on the same level that you are in your faith and in what you know about the word. It's important that we step up to lead by example to those who are there. And that's why I say like, man, you'll see me on the front row, even though I just got seven text messages and five emails and three people before I even stepped into the sanctuary of issues and problems and things we need to take care of. The second that I find myself in there, I'm lifting my hands, I'm jumping around, I'm celebrating, I'm connecting with people, why? because I can't expect anyone to really receive from God uh, uh, in a way greater than they see me receiving from God. As a leader, I understand that I help people enter into the presence of God. I help people receive from God based on how they watch me connect to God and how they watch me receive from God. And so... Uh, this is so important. It says the Levites knew that not everyone was sanctified. Not everyone had really dedicated their life over to God yet. So they said, you know what? Watch us. Follow us. We will help you in that process. Uh, we are going to help you and lead you and guide you into this. If you watch me and follow me, that's what the Apostle Paul said, right? Follow me as I follow Christ. Uh, you, you may need, need to have a living, uh, breathing flesh and blood example in front of you uh, to really make those decisions and to follow God totally. And that's what uh, they're doing here 
in this congregation. They finally have Israel coming in. And man, Israel has had a lifetime and multiple lifetimes, uh, which means like, like not just their life, but their father's life and their grandfather's life that have not been serving God. And they say, you know what? That's okay. Watch me as I serve God and let me be an example to you of leading you into the faith life. This is a part of our responsibility as leaders is to know that there are these people that are going to be in our congregations. There are these people who are coming in and have not sanctified themselves. And man, we need to be thankful for that. I, I've said all the time, man, I want, I want the sanctuary on a Sunday morning to smell of cigarettes and alcohol. Like I want it to smell like people who are broken and hurting and and dying. <laughs> Actually, we had a day a couple of weeks ago that there was a section in um, the church that didn't smell like uh, cigarettes, but they smelled like a cig of something, uh, you know, and uh, <laughs> I was, and someone came up to me like, hey, uh, we really need to spray over here because, uh, I know what that smells like and I know what that's supposed to be. I said, you know what? That's okay. We'll totally do that. But it excites me because I believe that that person was set free before they left. I believe that they heard the word of God and that they saw some people living faith in front of them. Uh, verse 18, for even a multitude of people, even many from Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar, and Zebulun had not cleansed themselves, yet they did eat the Passover otherwise than it was written. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, the good Lord pardon everyone. He that prepareth his heart to seek God, the Lord God of his fathers, though he be not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary, and the Lord hearkened to Hezekiah and healed the people. And man, I love this. Hezekiah was like, look, they don't know what they're doing yet. They have the right heart. They're seeking after God. They just don't quite know how to walk this thing out yet. Follow me as I follow Christ. And so he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to pray that God pardons them when they, you know, they say something they shouldn't say, when their words aren't really full of faith all the time, when uh, they're still trying to figure this thing out. He said, man, I'm going to pray on their behalf. I'm going to pray for them. And I'm going to be an example in front of them so that as they watch me, as they see me, they say, man, that's how I want to live my life. That's how I want to do it. And he said, God, I'm praying that you heal their hearts because they were seeking after God. I, I, this is a, it's a, how do I say it? it it's a, not a cliche word. It's a, a word that's used in modern Christianity. They say like, oh, that's a seeker sensitive church. And I said, man, what do you want to be? Because I want to develop a community of seekers. I want to develop people who are seeking God with all their heart, their soul, their mind and strength. I want people who are trusting in God and seeking his will in his life. I want to be sensitive to seekers. I want seekers to come to the church. What most people say when they're talking about a seeker sensitive church, they're saying like a, a sin sensitive church. They're a church that doesn't really talk about consequences. They're a church that doesn't really teach the totality of the word. Now that's not who we are. We are seeker sensitive, which means that we want to develop uh, young people. We want to develop people who have been uh, steeped in religion for a very long time to become seekers. One of the things that God was telling me uh, just a few weeks ago, I was at a leadership conference and I was spending time praying and really seeking God. And God spoke to me and said, you know, a part of your ministry is to really show people the truth of, of the word, to show people a life of faith, but specifically to show it to the de-churched group. And that's something that God's put specifically in my life and my heart is that there's a lot of people who have gone to church. They know about religion. They know about God, but they have become so closed off from what God has said to their life or, or uh, so closed off from receiving from God or seeking him. They know how to do the steps. They know when to say amen. They know what time church usually is. Like, you know, they went to church when they were young, but something happened that disconnected 
ousted them from the church and they didn't become, we're not talking about unchurched people who never went. I'm talking about de-churched people who are disconnected from the community of faith and disconnected from serving God. And just like Hezekiah, God is raising up faith for life leaders. That's you and that's me with opportunities for invitation to the de-churched population as well to really speak into the lives of those who believe in God, who say that they love Jesus, but have been disconnected from the life of community and disconnected from serving God and serving people. And because of it, desolation has happened in their lives. And so as Hezekiah, you and I are called to pray. Pray for opportunities for invitation. Pray for opportunities to uh, invite someone into the faith life. Also, Pray for opportunities to uh, speak against excuses that people have and to say, man, we need to get over those excuses so that you can come back into right relationship with God. We are praying for a community of seekers that seek God with all their heart, their soul and mind and strength. That's the bottom line. We're developing a community of seekers. We're developing a family that are going to seek God with everything that is within us. And as we do that, as Hezekiah did, God said, I heard Hezekiah's prayer because I saw his heart, because I saw the community gathering together. I saw the invitation. I saw them leading by example. And God said, I healed the people of Israel. But wait, it didn't really talk about that there were a whole bunch of sick people there. Yeah, I believe that God healed bodies and that God healed physical things, but that doesn't really sound like what they're talking about in chapter 30. No, I think that really what God was doing is said, I'm going to heal these souls. I'm going to heal broken hearts. I'm going to heal people who don't have hope anymore. I'm, I'm going to heal minds that have been stuck in, in stress. And I'm going to heal... Um, the, the souls, the mind, the will, and the emotions of these people who have been stuck in desolation and stuck in problems. And I'm going to heal them by using leaders that have my heart, that have a heart to invite people into faith life, that have a heart to show people by example, that have a heart to listen to somebody's bad story, to give them the good news, that have a heart to pray on behalf of those who don't know how to pray yet. He said, then I'm going to put my hand forward to heal the souls of those who have been broken. And that's one of the things that we pray every week, right? That God lead us into the paths of the hurting, the dying, the wounded, and the afflicted that we can speak your word, your will, your way, that bodies will be healed by the hands of your servants, that people's minds, hearts, and lives will be changed by your word that comes out of your servants' mouths. We thank you for it, Lord. Amen. Today, that's all I really wanna share with you. I know we did this a little bit different and uh, I hope that you really received from it today. Would you take this and, and share it with somebody uh, would you share it with another leader that may be in your life? Or maybe it's something that you just need to pray about yourself and say, God, would you give me opportunities for invitation, opportunities to uh, speak into somebody's bad news and give them the good news? This is the whole idea of what Hezekiah did, of what uh, the people of Judah did to invite Israel into that faith life. And so I'm, I'm praying for you all today. Hey, uh, if this really ministered to you, there's a couple ways that you can give uh, here into good ground. And I want you to notice that that's what happened here with the people of Judah that said that, okay, now we're going to give and we're going to show the people of Israel what it means to have a heart in giving. And as we give, they're going to see what God does in our lives. And so they gave, they prayed, and as they prayed and as they gave, the people of Israel celebrated with them and it was a huge party. It was a huge celebration. And as you give, I pray that you have opportunities to show the heart of giving and what and that you pray and assign every seed that you sow into good ground. 
and God is going to bless you abundantly. I'm praying for Hezekiah's to raise up in our church and in our community. I'm praying for our community to grow full of seekers of God with all our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. And that we have opportunities to bring in people like Israel to seek God with us, to see us live the faith life and become uh, seekers themselves. You know, every Sunday is a party because we celebrate what Jesus has done in our lives. Every Monday is a mission because we understand that we are here for such a time as this, place as this, and people as this to give the good news into bad stories. You know, we pray that every person, we say that every person is important because we know that we are not in relationships and in lives and across paths by accident. As Hezekiah's, we're going to step up and invite someone. And we know that every moment is for Jesus. So I look for opportunities to seek him in my everyday life to walk out the faith life in a way that changes hearts, lives, communities, cities for Jesus. Amen. Love you guys. I'll see you Sunday at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. right here at Faith for Life.